super accessible, and there is a lot of free parking. Tickets are at brownpapertickets.com and at good indie bookstores. Be in the house as we discuss race and multiculturalism, comic strips and protest art, Trayvon Martin and Ferguson, racial progress and backsliding, and, well, who we be. November 10th, social visionary Jeff Chang and myself, Davey D, will be in the house. See you there. And you're listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, also 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. The time is 2 p.m. Stay tuned for Terra Verde. From the Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Welcome to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show on KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley or KFCF in Fresno. My name is Adrienne Fitchfrankel. Today it's Halloween and we're going to talk about something scary. Escalated crowd control tactics by police at protest, uh, sorry, at pro-environment protests and ra- rallies. In the past, police used batons and dogs. Today, some use chemical agents, specialty impact munitions, and other dangerous technologies for which they, ha- they may have inadequate training. While countless people participate regularly in protests safely, there's been concern about new threats to protest rights within environmentalist circles for years. Events in the past couple of months have brought these issues into the public eye. The Ferguson, Missouri protests have highlighted the militarization of the police. On the other hand, September's People's Climate March and Flood Wall Street events brought hundreds of thousands of people into the street with hardly any incidents. Joining us are three attorneys who are experts in representing demonstrators in civil and criminal lawsuits and keeping the streets safe for protesters. Joining us by phone are Lauren Regan, Executive Director of the Civil Liberties Defense Center in Eugene, Oregon, and Mass Defense Committee Chair of the Eugene Chapter of the National Lawyers Guild, and Rachel Lederman, who has a private practice and is also uh, President of the National Lawyers Guild San Francisco Bay Area Chapter and Co-Chair of its Demonstrations Committee. She was also the the attorney for Scott Olson, who is a Marine Corps veteran who was critically injured in the Occupy Oakland protests on October 25th, 2011. Joining me in the studio is Alan Schlosser, legal director of the American Civil U- Liberties Union of Northern California, and he was the attorney for the UC Davis protesters who were pepper sprayed in, on November 18th, 2011. Before we get started, I do have a public service announcement, which is completely unrelated. KPFA is a sponsor of the San Francisco Green Festival. It's taking place November 14th, 15th, and 16th at Fort Mason in San Francisco. KPFA listeners, you can get a discount uh, just by listening to us and by uh, going to greenfestivals.org, plugging in the discount code KPFASF14. That's KPFASF like San Francisco, 14 like 2014. You'll get a 50% discount off admission to the Green Festival. All right. So, Alan, let's start with you. Um... If you just read the Bill of Rights, it can seem like the rights to free speech and free assembly, which are uh, what kind of undermines protest rights, are unlimited. But in fact, there are limits. What are the limits that police are enforcing in a protest environment? Well, the the basic structure um, is, yes, free speech is protected, and that goes way beyond giving a speech or the written word. It includes protest demonstrations, street art, street musicians. That wasn't recognized all the time, but it has developed, and people can feel confident of that. But none of these rights are are absolute. Uh, The governments are entitled to have reasonable time, place, and manner rules about where and how you can protest. And obviously, there are a lot of... um, debates and legal cases about what are legitimate uh, time, place, and manner rules. There's also the notion that the police can uh, can, uh, can arrest people for engaging what they consider unlawful activity, and, and that leads to another big debate about 
what levels of force the police can use. Um, and I guess that's going to be the subject of our discussion. I, I would just say two things that I found in my experience that leads to problems and, and maybe solutions, which is the police don't understand that when you're policing a demonstration, it's different than other kinds of law enforcement work. And the difference is it's not the cops against the criminals. It's people who are engaging in their constitutional rights, and the police have to recognize that they have a duty to protect constitutional rights. So the police have two things to worry about, law and order and protecting the demonstrators. And I think that often is not their attitude. It's obviously not their attitude, and it's kind of one of the things that always comes up in kind of pushing for changes. All right. Thank you for, for that introduction. It's very helpful. So let's talk about some of the escalated police tactics that are being used that are of concern for crowd control. Uh, Lauren, how does the mere presence of police impact people's propensity to exercise their right to protest, especially right now with the particular gear that's being used? Right. Well, we're seeing uh, especially a lot of local smaller police departments as soon as, you know, a handful of people, uh, you know, hold signs on the street corner, all of a sudden, you know, SWAT style police response uh, has been present. And there's a couple of problems with it. Number one, there are constitutional cases that say the police are not allowed to have an overpresence, meaning, you know, if there are 10 protesters, you can't have 10 cops standing nearby sort of glowering at them, that there has to be, you know, sort of a reasonable proportion of police to the, the assembly that's taking place. And the reason for that is that just the mere presence of police is considered a use of force. And in addition, the mere presence of police can often be a chill to people's First Amendment rights. They may be intimidated to join into the assembly or to exercise their rights uh, regarding their political beliefs because of the state presence that that is there. And I think this has been exacerbated by some of the new gear that um, has been a pretty common topic of conversation lately, uh, it came out that the military had been sort of donating their used um, equipment to local police departments, including light armored vehicles and bulletproof equipment and guns and all sorts of things, so that nowadays it's not uncommon to see police sort of looking like stormtroopers with dark masks on and weapons that look like machine guns or shotguns, even if they ultimately end up shooting rubber bullets. You know, that's obviously really difficult for people to discern while they're on the streets. And they just kind of have this menacing presence. And that is not only chilling to pretty much, you know, any activist that has good cognitive abilities, but it's really going to have a long-term chill on activists, especially, you know, lately with the climate justice movements. We've been seeing a lot of families and children coming out to protest. And when, um, you know, a Darth Vader-looking individual with a large weapon is standing in the corner watching over the protest, you know, you can bet that people with children or um, people with any kind of health concerns are going to be really intimidated in remaining at that assembly. And so, um, you know, those are two of the main problems with the militarization of police and the overpresence of police. But, of course, once you have that mass of geared-up cops, it's also much more likely that they may overreact. You know, when um, cops come out with all their toys, they want to use them. And oftentimes we have seen uh, police response being used as, quote-unquote, training incidents where, you know, they probably didn't need to take the light armored vehicle out for a spin on a Friday afternoon, but they've been wanting an opportunity to use it, so they're going to drive it down to the protest. And that's just not a, un, that's not acceptable under the current state of the law. Okay. So, um, 
moving on from that kind of the big picture of just the mere presence, let's go on to talking about some of the cases that I talked about at the beginning. Um, and one thing that I think is interesting is that both of these cases um, are cases in which technology was used for crowd control is not only a concern because it was used at all, but also because it was actually used improperly. So, Rachel, you were the attorney for Scott Olson. Um, please tell us briefly, what were the two technologies that impacted him, and how was he injured by them? Sure. Um, the Oakland police um, used um, specialty impact munitions, which are, um, in his case, were what are referred to as bean bags, but are actually cloth bags full of lead shot that are fired from a 12-gauge shotgun. Um, and uh, they also used explosive uh, tear gas grenades called CS blast grenades, which um, people often refer to as flashbangs because they have a flash of light and a loud um, sound associated with them, um, but they're a little bit different than the flashbangs that the police use in barricaded suspect situations, um, and they emit tear gas. Um, so these are weapons that um, the Oakland police have purchased for crowd control. Um, and for some, um, in terms of the beanbags for some other situations. And their practice has been that when they use chemical agents, including the explosive tear gas grenades and other types of tear gas devices, um, they have officers who are at the ready to shoot the specialty impact munitions at anyone who looks like they might be about to throw a partly spent tear gas canister back at the police because when police adopt um, these, uh, this militarized approach, it tends to escalate the confrontation between the police and, and the crowd, and there are going to be people that, a few people in the crowd who might pick up the tear gas canister and throw it back. Um, so uh, what happens is the police deploy the chemical agents, most people in the crowd start running uh, in different directions because the way that Oakland has been using these devices is to throw them right into the middle of the crowd. People are running all over the place. And then there's officers who are um, aiming at people who look like they're bending down or about to throw some object who may be a considerable distance away. The officers are wearing gas masks, which restrict their vision. So what happened to Scott Olson, uh, we actually don't believe that the officer was most likely aiming to shoot Scott Olson in the head. We think he was aiming at somebody a distance away behind Scott Olson who was actually throwing something. But um, Scott began running when there was a flashbang explosion next to him and took a step and a half and was shot in the head with a lead-filled beanbag at fairly close range, and his skull was shattered, and he sustained permanent brain damage. And so that's an example of a tragedy that occurred as a result of the joint use of these uh, these two technologies. So we're demanding that the Oakland police actually give uh, both of those types of weapons up and desist from this practice of using them together, which is inherently extremely dangerous and unnecessary. And just as an update, there, is a, there are little bits of good news in Scott Olson's case. He has had some good recovery and he won his case, right? He um, has permanent brain damage that's incurable, but he did um, receive a substantial settlement of uh, $4.5 million um, last March. Um, that will, you know, provide for his needs. All right. And I'm just referring to he was able to regain his ability to speak. That's right. Um, so, um, Alan, you worked on a case, uh, on the case of the students being pepper sprayed at UC Davis. Um, that was a protest about the rising cost of going to university, but the result, resulting policies will apply to all protests. Um, and of course, pepper spray is sometimes used in the environmental protest context. Um, how did the police use pepper spray improperly in that instance? Very badly. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I almost thought it's not really so, but um, that, that incident, Rachel was talking about a tragedy as no one got seriously hurt and it was almost a comedy in terms of a Keystone Cops comedy of how just an absolute failure of leadership in the police department 
um, with the police chief standing on the side while one of the officers was spraying 10 sitting protesters in the eyes, and then the whole world saw that, and a complete lack of policies. Um, and, you know, I think one thing, that was also an Occupy-related protest. I, you know, I do think that Occupy, one of the things it contributed to the world was kind of educating people about the their First Amendment rights and the limits of their First Amendment rights. The police in, in Davis just had no idea how to deal with students who were violating a, about to violate a university rule to set up a tent on campus. And in their minds, since it violated a university rule, they could get them out of there and they were carrying on their belts kind of military strength pepper spray that absolutely shouldn't be used close range, even by the military. They had never been trained in it. Um, and Officer Pike stepped forward and, and, and fired away. And um, it, it really, it's, it's kind of a situation where everyone, the university, uh, agreed this was a huge problem. And as a result, and they have a new police chief, you know, we've developed some policies um, that I think are, you know, going to make a difference. But as Rachel knows better than anyone else, you can have uh, policies in place as Oakland did, and it doesn't guarantee a good result. All right, we're going to come back to policies in a minute. Uh, this is Adrian Fitch Frankel. You're tuned to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. You're listening to Alan Schlosser of the American Civil Liberties Union of Northern California, Lauren Regan of the Silver Li- Civil Liberties Defense Center, and Ra- Rachel Lederman of the National Lawyers Guild of uh, San Francisco Bay Chapter. So, um, uh, Lauren, there are also some, um, there's a whole list of things that uh, I know that you, you're aware of that you, you've worked on, some really disturbing cases where a baby was maced at a protest, uh, and an officer shot directly into the baby's face, um, you know, a variety of really disturbing um, situations. But I'd actually like to just focus on a couple of things so that we have enough time to move on to talk about um, best practices and how things are improving, you know, how we can improve things. Um, so one thing kind of at the extreme end of the spectrum are some of the new technologies that could be used um, uh, that aren't being used on a widespread basis yet. One example is sound cannons. Uh, could you tell us about that technology? Uh, sure. A sound cannon is basically this device that is used normally in conjunction with these light armored vehicles, these tank looking things. And um, the sound is so powerful that it literally can cause people to lose control of muscle function. Uh, a lot of people have experienced like urinating or defecating on themselves as a result of it. But the idea is that the the noise is so deafening and so painful to bystanders that they are forced to move away. And it is um, it is used as a crowd control device, though, like you mentioned, I would say rarely. All right. And um, one thing I also wanted to ask you to talk about is one particular situation where, um, well, a lot of situations, protests and rallies are actually targeted at particular corporations. Um, and this is actually an example of how uh, corporations have been, um, you know, possibly colluding with police. Uh, could you tell us about your uh, Texas case in which you saw that happening with prepper spray? Sure. Um, we represent a bunch of tar sands resistors in northeast Texas that were fighting to stop the KXL pipeline, which is owned and devised by TransCanada, um, which is a massive corporation. And part of the process of putting these pipelines into the ground is to clear cut giant swaths of territory so that they can dig these holes. And um, there was a protest in Cherokee County, which is this rural county that had probably never seen a protest before. And it involved a few people up in the trees, sort of in makeshift tree sits. And then the majority of people were standing on the side of a public roadway, just simply holding signs and uh, occasionally chanting and cheering for the tree sitters. And at one point, um, the rural sheriff's deputies 
got frustrated with the crowd and got frustrated with what their role was at this protest and they just started indiscriminately spraying pepper spray into the faces of these people standing on the roadway who a were not expecting it at all because they hadn't even been told to leave an area or to um you know move back or anything like that and b these were school teachers and grandmas and little kids and you know they they were not rough and tumble looking uh, activists in any sense um, and so after, as this was happening, I ran over to the incident commander and was conversing with him, trying to get him to call back his dogs uh, and kind of yelling at him about the indiscriminate use of OC spray. And one of the Trans Canada representatives walked over uh, to the police officers that were standing near us. And I'm assuming he didn't know, you know, who I was. Uh, and he slapped the sheriff's deputy on the back and said, you know, good job today, boys. We'll bring over some pepper spray tonight to replace what you used today. And, you know, literally, you know, out loud acknowledged that this corporation was gifting chemical weapons to local law enforcement in order to encourage them to kind of repeat that tactic in the future. And it was a very su successful tactic because a lot of the folks that were involved in that rally had never been to a protest before. And their first experience is to have, you know, chemical agents sprayed in their face. And of course, that makes it far more likely that they are never going to return to community activism again. Right. So, so pretty successful tactic by the corporation. Rachel, let's turn to solutions and best practices. Uh, in the course of your work, and uh, some of this has been actually in conjunction with Alan and the ACLU, uh, you've developed some um, uh, crowd control policies uh, in um, Oakland as a result of some of these lawsuits. Can you, you just give us some highlights of some of the best practices that have emerged from that process? Well, the written policy um, that we wrote for the Oakland Police and which became um, part of the settlement and federal court order in um, some of the litigation um, that we've brought about these uh, demonstrations um, is a, a very good policy on paper. The problem is that uh, the police don't follow it and um, it really gets to like the essential problem, which isn't just the weapons itself. It's the conundrum of holding the police accountable. But uh, the policy uh, is uh, that the police, you know, will um, uh, facilitate First Amendment expression with um, the least amount of police intervention and force possible. That's the overall policy. And then um, we gave them very specific guidelines on when they can stop a demonstration by declaring an unlawful assembly and uh, when they can make mass arrests and um, and what would happen um, following the mass arrest because in Oakland we saw a lot of intimidation through um, illegal um, lengthy uh, pre-charging incarceration of people who were unlawfully arrested at protests. Um, and then we gave, we um, prohibited uh, certain types of weapons um, uh, for crowd control entirely, um, and we allowed limited use of some others, namely the chemical agents. So um, the, the specialty impact munitions, actually, according to the Oakland Crowd Control Policy, they are a prohibited method of crowd control. Um, but the policy provides that under some very extreme circumstances um, that basically amount to um, a situation where uh, deadly force could be used, um, where a person presents an immediate danger of death or great bodily injury to the police or to somebody else, um, and the person can be safely targeted without endangering other crowd members. In other words, they need to be away from the crowd. And there's nothing else that can be done, like, for example, arresting them. Um, then a specialty impact munition can be used. It can't be used indiscriminately as a way of driving, trying to drive the crowd away. All right. Um, so that's what was violated on a very uh, broad scale in, in the 
the at the Occupy event where Scott Olson and a whole bunch of other people were injured. And I know there's some ongoing litigation to try to uh, move that process forward. Um, Ellen, could you tell us a little bit about just a couple of highlights um, about the uh, what came out of the um, pepper spray incident and the new policies at UC? Right. Um, well, in some ways, uh, they, uh, after having worked with Rachel on the Oakland and really drawing up what I thought was a very good policy, uh, that was in my mind when we were able, when we won our lawsuit and sat down with UC Davis. The one thing I found that was interesting and in some ways makes a campus setting harder, it's kind of counterintuitive, is that they have this idea, the administrators, that there's a First Amendment right to learn and teach. Now, of course, there is a right to learn and teach, but in the, their mind, that means there has to be quiet. There can't be noisy protests or protests that might offend people. And I think, you know, again, with Occupy helping and uh, the Davis policy reflects it, they recognize that, yes, the academy is a place to learn, but it's also a public forum and kind of the garden variety place where students should learn to be citizens by protesting. Uh, that's hard to get across to, to universities. Uh, I'm, ki I'm kind of hoping that the result of a good policy is better than it's been in Oakland. All right. Um, Lauren, I'm going to give you the last word. We just have a minute left before we go to uh, give you guys an opportunity to uh, give out your URL, URLs. Um, but, Lauren, let's end on a high note. Um, should people be afraid of protesting, or how should people feel at this point? Well, I think there's, there's two quick responses I will give to that. You know, number one, uh, the cases that we're talking about today or the ones that you may read about in the paper or hear about in the news are actually pretty rare. There are thousands and thousands of protests that happen in small towns, big cities all the time where nothing bad or scary happens. And so, you know, hopefully people won't walk away with the idea that free speech rights and assembly, you know, is dangerous business. Because I think the second component is if police or the state in general learns that these tactics of violating people's rights and, you know, using excessive force are a successful method to deter people from exercising their rights, then we will likely see more of it than less. And, you know, federal litigation is incredibly expensive. It takes a long time to, you know, wind its way through the process. It's not an ideal way to be addressing these kind of tactics. Lauren, but I'm it, sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off because we're just about done with the program. I apologize. So um, I'm going to give each of you a chance to just shout out your, your URLs. Uh, Lauren, let's start with you. CLDC.org. Okay, so that was Civil Liberties Defense Center, CLDC.org. Their switchboard is 541-687-9180. Um, yes, that was right. Alan? Uh, ACLUNC.org. So ACLUNC.org or ACLU.org, which also has a whole section on protest rights. Uh, the mainline switchboard for ACLU of Northern California is 415-621-2493. And, um, uh, um, and let's see, what, who else are we... Sorry, let me pull up your <laughs> URL here. Um, so um, hold on a second. All right, and Rachel, go ahead. Ready for you. Hi, uh, the, uh, the National Lawyers Guild is um, locally nlgsf.org or nationally nlg.org. Okay, that was nlg.org. And um, uh, do you have a mainline switchboard for the NLG, or if you don't, that's all right. 415-285-5067. Uh, all right, there you go. All right, um, I urge everyone to take a look at those websites. They have lots of resources on uh, protest rights and ways to uh, protest safely um, and also ways to get involved um, in um, uh, communicating your your interests. All right, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks to Wesley for engineering the show, and have a great weekend. Hi. 
This is Greg Bridges, host of Transitions on Traditions, inviting you to join me for a conversational voyage with a true icon of modern music. Herbie Hancock, Saturday, November 1st at First Congregational Church of Oakland, 2501 Harrison Street at 27th. Innovative pianist, composer, winner of multiple Grammys and an Academy Award, as well as a Kennedy Center honor. Herbie Hancock will be discussing his new autobiography, Possibilities, A Voyage of Music, Faith, Life's Challenges and Triumphs, and much more. Get your advance tickets at brownpapertickets.com and through our co-sponsor, Marcus Books, and other supportive bookstores 